and welcome to the Scriptures Are Real podcast. This is the podcast where we talk about elements of the scriptures that have become very real to us because we hope that we can draw more and more power out of the scriptures. We need that power in our lives. I'm your host, Kerry Mielstein, and today I have a guest who uh, just uh, has been a dear friend of mine for a very long time. We've got Jennifer Clark Lane with us, who uh, I first met, I think, in a Ugaritic class when I was like a junior or something like that. It's been a while, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and. And then we were together at uh, BYU Hawaii in uh, the religion department there and have just uh, stayed uh, close. And, and uh, I've, I'm a big fan of Jennifer's work on adoption and covenant and uh, uh, her, her book on, uh, I can't remember the exact title. What's the title of your book on yeah. covenant? Finding Christ in the Covenant Path. Yeah, it's a fantastic book I would recommend to anyone. Um, and so I'm just, uh, she's, well, I'll let her tell you a little bit about herself, but I find her both an amazing person, an amazing administrator, an amazing scholar, and a good friend. Uh, so welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, Carrie. It really is a privilege to be here with you. Um, I, I have happy memories going back to when, because you were working on your undergraduate, I was doing a, a one-year master's, and we were both studying Ugaritic, and you your Hebrew and ancient Near Eastern languages has always far surpassed my own, but uh, it was it was fun to work through those texts. And it was fun. I think that class had just you and me and Frank Judd. Am I remembering was, right? There were three, yeah. yeah. With Paul Hoskison and our little tiny room, and that yeah. was a good opportunity. Yeah, it was. So, so well, yeah. tell us a little about yourself. Absolutely. So from there, um, I, I had finished my undergraduate with history and minor in philosophy, but near the end, I'd, I'd had an interest in, in learning more about the ancient Near East with the idea of maybe looking at ancient scripture as a possible um, career tra trajectory. And um, Keith and I had married right before the master's program. So it was a one-year program. Um, I did ancient Near Eastern studies under as part of the international area studies program that they had at the time. And so we did that. And then Keith and I moved down to Southern California and he started a PhD program in, um, at Claremont Graduate University. So his field's religion with an emphasis of philosophy and theology of religion. And a year later, I started mine. So it was history of Christianity. Because again, the, the Hebrew, I, you know, both Hebrew and Greek, I studied enough to know that it was best to leave to other people. I, I love the history dimension more than the linguistic, even though I actually do a lot of work with word studies and yeah, I love yeah. language. You yeah. undersell yourself. You, you are fantastic yeah. <laughs> at all of them, but it's one of the great things about you is how, how broad uh, you're, you're able to go with, uh, because you did a lot of New Testament and, and Greek right. studies, but you did the ancient uh, the more ancient stuff. So I know when we say ancient people think Greek, I don't think a Greek's no, modern no, to even me, but further. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Further back. You, you do that ancient stuff. And then you did uh, modern, well, history of yeah. Christianity. And I think you did crusades. And so, I mean, you've got right. a really broad spectrum you're yeah. an expert on. So, so with the history of Christianity, I actually was thinking I'd do early Christian, but as time went on, I, I was drawn more and more to the late medieval. And so I ended up doing a dissertation on um, pilgrimage to Jerusalem in the late medieval era and kind of how it changed and connections with, between late medieval Franciscan practices, uh, passion piety, and then sort of reorienting Jerusalem pilgrimage as a meditation on the passion of Christ, and then how that lined up with other practices, and then also replication of sort of it's like the stations of the cross, the Sacramenti, different ways of experiencing being in Jerusalem in Europe um, through that equivalency of video experience and compassio of suffering with Christ. So, so I do love, whether Jerusalem in the ancient period or Jerusalem in the medieval period, or and then the Greco-Roman, the, the time of Christ, it's amazing. It's, it really is, I think, play, sacred place has always been something that's spoken to me. And yeah. so that it's exciting today to have an opportunity to talk some about, again, Jerusalem now. Between the, the PhD, just to get, catch up our, our listeners, um, you and I had a chance to work together at BYU Hawaii, and those were great years. Um, both you and I, for a while, were teaching with both religion and um, history. And yeah, which that was, was, it was, it was really fun. They, they fed into each other. And, yeah. and that's something that's drawn me to the reading we're looking at today, because this was a, a, an truly really a big realignment in the, the time period of the ancient Near East when um, the, 
Babylonians, the Chaldeans had um, been the dominant power, but when the Persians came along that it was just, they created such a large empire and they, they handled things such a different way than the Babylonians or the Assyrians had that it, it created um, a, new, a new space, a time, an opportunity for um, the Israelites, for, for the Jews at this point, primarily who we're looking at, um, who had been living in Babylon to come back. And I just, to me, we talk about scriptures being real. I, I think about on the, the stage of human history, these times of people's moving around is, we live in a time today where we, we're seeing a lot of migrants and people needing to change either for opportunity or because they're being displaced because of war. And that, that dimension of, of human experience has, has always been part of, of mortality. And I think that to, I'm always really intrigued by time periods where there's a lot of upheaval and there's a lot of change. Not that like, it's nice to have stability. I like yeah. stability in my own personal life. <laughs> Yeah. I like predictability, but, um, but as far as understanding the human condition and understanding how Heavenly Father works with us as his children, I think the times of change are um, perhaps something that we all go through and we don't necessarily want to go through. They can be, they can be you know, really we talk about upheaval. And I think, um, I think about the Jews being in Babylon and they were there. Um, some of them got there a little earlier, like 606, but most of them had been brought over by 587. And it, it wasn't, and this is something I think it's, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around. It wasn't like every single citizen of the, the Southern Kingdom was like transplanted to Babylon. The, 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 and so trying to think about, okay, we're not only looking at displacement, but we're also looking at separation. The, yeah. the, Dispersion. The yeah, the elite get moved. That they, um, the 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 Chaldeans or the Neo Babylonians, they they have their own agenda, and so bringing the the political, the milit military, religious elite with them helps them sort of maintain their power by bringing the leaders to the court. And kings will often not have done that, but then they left a lot of people who were more the peasant kinds, and so so for seventy years people that had had a shared identity are, have very life, different life stories, different, the generations go in different directions. And so what we're looking at when we, we look at these books of scriptures in Ezra and Nehemiah is a time period in the, the late sixth, they're going into the, a lot of the fifth century where people are getting back together again. And it's not as human history goes, it's it's not very always very smooth, and it's yeah. a it's a it's a kind of a a rocky time. But, but it's and I and think, uh, yeah. maybe I could just interrupt and say that they both have both the groups in Babylon and the groups that are behind have these interesting things to navigate that then are are bring a different navigation when they come together because the people in Babylon have been dealing with the Babylonian culture and how that influences them. The exactly. people who stay back in in the land uh edomites move in a whole yes. bunch of other people samaritans move in so suddenly yeah. they have other cultures that they're dealing with and so they've both become different exactly. over that time period uh and uh, depending upon where you were in babylon you'd have a different experience than someone in another yeah. part and so yeah. all these differences that then they're trying to integrate together exactly and so this is a really it's a uh it's just fascinating and again it, it, it's sort of like we're talking about scriptures being real this is real this is yeah. so human i think that that we know we can see the lord's hand but the lord in guiding us and moving us forward he's working with human beings and he always has and he always will yeah. and he's trying to help us become more godly but but we're not always you know we're, we're learning as we go and it's a long long process and so yeah. it's kind of his fulfilling his covenant promises of bringing people back. He's working through these outside forces. And it's, it's fascinating. We look at Cyrus and the, the beginning of the Persian empire. He had, and, and was this something that sort of the spirit worked into his mind and his heart perhaps, but he had a unique vision of how to 
administer an empire that really was a radical shift. So rather than, yeah. uh, and all, even afterwards, people are going to go back. We see this um, under with the, the solutions and um, under the Hellenistic kingdoms and into the Greek era, there's more of a sense of wanting people to do your things, your, their, your way to run the show. But the, the Persians, starting with Cyrus, had a much more laissez-faire, um, some very light hand of, of, and this is fascinating. In fact, there's um, the beginning of Ezra in the first couple chapter, the first couple of verses talks and, about and, this. Uh, for our, our uh, I should have talked to you about yeah. this before, but uh, for our, our, most of the audience is just listening, but there are a few yeah. people who are watching so i'll probably sure, just share the, the screen to put up. those scriptures up but yeah. but you can use whatever you want i'll just try and follow yeah, along with absolutely you. so i'll just read a few verses but what i want to share is also a parallel text from what's called the cyrus cylinder where mm. we have another count of cyrus kind of in his own way of thinking describing what in fact maybe i'll start with the cyrus cylinder then go here so you can kind of see and then hear the difference so here is cyrus the sort of recording in his own sort of thought, how is he doing, what he's doing, why he's doing, is he's letting people that he's conquering have their own gods, have their own laws, so that the Persians were much, they, they definitely wanted people to pay taxes. So they, they yeah. wanted people to not revolt and have re rebellions, but if they would just sort of be a part of the empire that they could do it in their own terms. And so that's a really, it's just a fascinating way of, of not trying to impose your um, religion or worldview on your subject people. And so this is, I'll read first from the Cyrus Cylinder, and then let's look at this text together. So this is from the Cyrus Cylinder, um, which gives us a sense of sort of the mindset of, and then we're going to kind of hear in the, the book of Ezra, the same account. So here's sort of the, in the voice of Cyrus on this record. I returned to these sacred cities on the other side of the Tigris. Um, so talking about where he, from Babylon, the sanctuaries of which have been in ruins for a long time, the images which used to live therein. So he's taking, so the, the Babylonians had gathered sacred statues and implements from many different places and brought them all to Babylon. And so he's now conquered Babylon and he's returning yep. these um, things that belong to temples and to shrines throughout where the, the Babylonians had gathered them. So he says he's returning um, to these sacred cities, the things which used to live therein. So he has this very sense of them, like this is the home of these different gods. They're being returned to their homes. The images which used to live they're in and established for them permanent sanctuaries. And this is another thing that's extraordinary is that he's actually funding, rebuilding um, places, temples and, and shrines for, for the subject peoples. I also gathered all their former inhabitants and returned them to their habitation. So again, he's letting people leave Babylon, go back to their, their home in um, Judea. Furthermore, I resettled upon the command of Marduk. So this is would have been the Babylonian chief god, um, the, the great lord, all, all the gods of Sumer and Akkad. So Sumer and Akkad were cities, states that had had their own deities that had been kind of absorbed by Babylon. Yeah, Assyria um, is basically, uh, Akkad is Assyria in, yeah. in and, and simplest terms. Sumer will be like Iraq. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, further south than Babylon, yeah. Yeah. Um, so he, he gathered up all these statues of the gods and he's returning them. So he talks about the sort of history of Nabonius had brought into Babylon to the anger of the Lord of all the gods. So this idea of that Marduk was behind this. He was, he's so, from his perspective, he's doing the right thing. He's feeling some kind of approval for this move to return all of these um, statues of gods to their, their homes. And I love this last phrase. So, um, so he, that these had been brought to Babylon at the anger of the Lord of the gods, unharmed in their former chapels, the places which make them happy. <laughs> <laughs> so they're going home to where they are happy in their, their native lands. And of course, in the temple, there was no statue of Jehovah, <laughs> but there were a lot of, of implements 
used for worship that had been brought to a lot of vessels and um, precious items that had been brought to Babylon. And those are part of the process of being returned to, to Jerusalem. Yeah. So it's, it's just a beautiful thing. And then now just to see these, these, this, these both ain't the ancient texts. This is kind of from the perspective of someone who's, who's seeing, okay, well, Jehovah is really the one he, um, Cyrus is thinking that, that Marduk is pushing him along and Ezra has a, has a, the, the text here is a slightly different perspective where it says in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled so that Cyrus is acting to fulfill prophecy. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put in writing saying, thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he hath charged me to build him a, a house I'm going to move my zip. Yeah, house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. And so he's feeling this, this, like he's, he's acting, just like he described himself, that he's acting on this impression to let everyone go back. And, um, and so this, I think, is then this, the sense of, okay, let's bring the people back, let him go up to Jerusalem and build the house of the Lord God. And, um, and then bringing all of these, these resources back. And so we have a description here in verse five, as you say, they the rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin. So this is the Southern kingdom, the, the, the elite who had gone to Babylon, the, the priests, the Levites, or the people who had this, the sort of ecclesiastical spiritual authority. Um, and with them, with all them whose spirit God had raised, to go to build the house of the Lord, which is Jerusalem. And I think this is an interesting little phrase because I think it speaks to a reality we don't talk about it as much. And that is that one is not all the Jews go back. Some of them decide yeah. they're, they're very happy in Babylon. They don't really want to go. And basically it's almost a wilderness at this point. Yeah. <laughs> you have to rebuild a society. That's when you're in a really beautiful, comfortable, successful home it's it's a hard yeah. sacrifice and and not all of them will have stayed faithful you know no. that over time they're going to have been a significant number we don't know the percentages but but not everybody was through yeah. those 70 years stayed focused on their covenant identity and keeping keeping the laws and there would have been people who have started living like babylonians because they were in babylon and it was comfortable and easy and so, so there's this, that the phrase, I think that all, with all them who spirit God had raised is speaks to what it took for these people to um, be willing to start and to be pioneers, to start all over again and go into a land that they is, for many of them will be younger, younger generation. They wouldn't have known it personally. Yeah. Um, so I think this... it really speaks to, yeah, a lot of courage. I agree. It, it kind of reminds me, actually, of the group uh, that have left uh, the Nephites that have left and gone to Zarahemla. And then you have this group that says, well, we want to go back, but it's foreign. They don't know the place. They, yeah. There are other people that are living there. Right. It's it is a scary thing. And and it would yeah. seem that actually the majority don't go mm -hmm. um, that uh, this is uh, for a while. There are more people in diaspora than there are in Jerusalem, uh, people yeah. keep moving to Jerusalem and, and the size grows over time, yes. but it's not, uh, like you said, it's not suddenly everybody picked or even most and, people picked yeah. up and went back to Jerusalem. Right. And, and I think that does help us understand that, you know, even though we have a temple being um, rededicated, I think it's 512, but that all throughout the fifth century, so all through the 400s, it's an ongoing process of building up the walls yeah. and just getting the city. And then once you get the city established, then they're sort of creating a kingdom again. And yeah. even though, again, it's underneath, of course, the Persian rule, but, but establishing what you mentioned, the Edomites and then the Samaritans, you have these other peoples that are in the land that they were used to be in. And sort of, this is a complicated project. Yeah, yeah, it is. And to, to kind of speak to your point about uh, covenant identity and just to kind of connect this for my audience to some things sure. we've talked about in the past. Um, 
we've talked about that uh, the, the Northern Kingdom, when they're scattered, didn't seem to maintain a covenant consciousness, right. and thus they're, they assimilate and, and are lost uh, yeah. as much because they lost track of the covenant as anything. Yeah. But that Southern Kingdom, the covenant consciousness, when they're scattered, they, they keep that covenant consciousness. But as yeah. you said, not everybody, and that's, that's going to be the case all the time. Uh, but including what is called the Mormon migration or whatever, uh, you know, coming out to the West and so on. There are people who just, that's too much. I'm, I'm done or I've lost my covenant consciousness. Uh, uh, even great families like the Whitmer family and so on, right? So yeah. uh, you get uh, this loss of covenant consciousness among some, but but there's a, a, a core and large group of the what we'd call members of the kingdom of Judah, or they at this point really are starting to you, we use Take the term Jews, Jews. yeah, yeah. Um, that keep that covenant consciousness wherever they are, and then some of them will come back to the covenant land to rebuild it, but others stay outside and still maintain their covenant consciousness. Right. right. So that you do have those who have keep that identity and practice but aren't necessarily living with what's increasingly becoming, you know, return to this homeland. Yeah. So it, it's a very, it's a complicated time period. And, and, and scholars aren't completely sure like how to reconcile everything between Ezra and Nehemiah, as far as a strict timeline of what's yeah. happening when, and who like, it looks like, you know, Ezra and Nehemiah are actually brought back in later waves as individuals, yeah. not right early on. Like we know that, Ezra was in Babylon and Nehemiah was in, um, in one of the Persian capitals. Yeah. And yep. so they're, um, it's, it's an ongoing process, which is again, fascinating because it's just this, this longer time of, of change. And so I, I just appreciate that just because I think it speaks to our lives. Some of the themes that I think about when I read these chapters are that the need for faithfulness, but patience, like we just have to hold on because you don't know when, like they were, they were hoping, they were trusting in promises that were made that the remnant shall return, that they would yeah. be able to go back, but they didn't know when, you know, you know, it was kind of sort of in the Lord's timing that he brought Cyrus to power and the political landscape dramatically changed. And so there was a window um, to, to move things forward. And sometimes we see dramatic, I mean, think about our own lives, not, not maybe some of the younger viewers, but those, those of us who are um, a little, little older, having seen political changes that were really dramatic in um, the early 90s, where in the fall of the, um, yeah, the Berlin the wall. wall. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. you have Gorbachev and this sense of perestroika and let's an openness. And all of a sudden, you know, I, I saw this firsthand. My sister was a missionary within the first couple of years that the East opened up and she was in um, the, the Czech, what would be kind of the Czech Republic. And, wow. and then, so they, they, we were able to put missionaries in places we never dreamed, even, you know, we'd never dreamed that no. you'd ever have people in Russia in your lifetime, but yet no. boom, political circumstances changed and there was an opening, but then you know, the last 10 years have been kind of disappointing, you know, and hard because yeah. there's a lot of, of things have not gone as well as we would have hoped with yeah. Putin in the last 10 years of decreasing freedom of religion in, in Russia. It, so, you know, things are so, so often be outside of our, and we just have to trust that the Lord will help have all things work together for good, but it's not always a constant uphill, beautiful um, yeah. climb. You know, as, as you were talking about that in the faith and the time period, I, I don't know why this has never occurred to me before, but as a historian, and I look back and I say, well, 70 years that they're out of Jerusalem and they can come back is not very long. And in this long time period, looking from 2000, well, more than 2000 years uh, later, 70 years does seem short. But I would guess during those 70 years, it seemed like forever. Yeah. And, and I hadn't really thought of that before, but for the generations that were uh, being born or that were dying yeah. uh, or approaching death, uh, being away from the homeland, it probably seemed like a lifetime, and it was. Yeah, yeah, and, and just sort of the analogy to our own sort of recent history, you think about the time between the Russian Revolution in 1917 and then the breakup of the Soviet Union in 
90, 88 or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just that that it's close to 70, 80 years, you know, yeah. so, but it's, it's multiple generations and not very many people who remember what was life like before. And so I think the appreciating that of, of how much the world can change. Now, of course, things change a lot faster in the modern era, but, but we're looking at something comparable, I think, to yeah. have this dramatic shift to Babylon of this elite group, and then this shift back, even though it, it takes place over time, so I think we can, it can kind of understand what it's like. And, and while we're talking about what it would have felt like, I think there's a great passage. Um, why don't we turn to Ezra chapter three, the first couple of verses there, um, talking about how this would feel to be there when the temple starts being built. Because for those who kept the, this covenant consciousness, who those who remember Jehovah and the, his, the, the temple is, where his presence can be and this longing, this, this to be back there, to be able to um, both, of course, to keep the law, which so much of it is tied to, to worship at the temple and to sacrifice and to the reconciliation that brought that, that this longing uh, to want to be there. And, um, and so when you see here, the beginning of Ezra three, that these, that they're coming together, those who have arrived by this point, and it, this is before the temple itself is built, but you, I think it shows this sort of, this eagerness to, to try to get back something that they've lost. So in verse two, then stood up Yeshua, the son of uh, Josadak and his, his brethren, and Zerubbabel, the son of um, Shealtiel and his brethren and, and builded the altar of God, the, the God of Israel, to offer burnt offerings thereon, as is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And in verse three, they set up the altar upon its bases, and then they're they're nervous because they're they're not necessarily you know they're they're in what's basically hostile territory, and but they're they're so eager, even in this this state of probably feeling like they're just camping out. <laughs> Yeah. And they're they're watching their back, but they're they want to get back. They want to worship. They want to um, to be able to to restore that covenant relationship and co through their their worship and their covenant faithfulness. And then you see in verse four, where not only they're offering these burnt offerings as is required by morning and evening, but they're also bringing back the temple festivals. And so yeah. they kept the feast of tabernacles, and it's called Sukkot. Um, as is written and offer daily burnt offerings. And so they're, they're following all these, these practices even before they get a temple. They like, let's, let's start with an altar. We can do that. And trying to, um, but you see in verse six that the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. So that I think says something, the intensity and the focus and the, just the love of the Lord and the desire to worship that drives these people, drives them to leave their comfortable homes, to go into this, um, for most of them, it's going to be a, a new land, even though they know it's their, the land of their, their covenant promise, but it's still, it's not necessarily their home as individuals. Mm -hmm. It's not their, their life experience. Yeah. And that they're willing to do this because this is where the Lord has, this is their, their sense of this is the place to, to worship. And now they can do that, something that they've missed for all these many, many decades and restarting that. So I, I love these, these passages just to show the, um, where things they're, they're, they're just jumping right in. Yeah. And then uh, a few verses later, um, we see verse 10 and here's kind of a milestone. So the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord then this is, this is enormous. Like, they're just beginning, but they're still overwhelmed. They're delighted. They set the priests in their apparel. So the, the priests are, are dressing with their the sacred robes and their appropriate dress for worship and using the trumpets, which are going to be part of temple worship. And the Levites, um, the sons of Aspath, with symbols to praise the Lord after the ordinances of David, king of Israel. 
and see the joy they have. And they, sh they sang together by chorus. So this is a, presumably the, the groups of priests that are organized into different um, groups. They sang together by chorus in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good and his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout they, when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. So mm. this is, I mean, for you think about these younger generation that had, that had always heard these stories that hadn't experienced it for themselves. So this would have been the vast majority of people, even someone who was a baby when they were born at the beginning of the Babylonian captivity would be an old person now. And mm -hmm. so the fact that, and this is what we see in verse 12, there were still a few, even though we talk in the ancient world, it gets a little confusing because up until the modern era, the median age is quite a bit lower, yeah. but that's because so many people died before the age of 10 and so many babies died before the age of one. And so people did live to their 70s and 80s and 90s, but, but the average age was much, much lower because so many children died. Um, yeah, well, and, and also there's not uh, so much medical help. So injuries exactly. and things like that were, weren't survived very right. well because of infection and whatever. Yeah. So yeah. if so you were you someone who both. stayed healthy, you could live a long time, but most but people don't stay healthy so their great. whole life. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so longevity was unusual. And the fact that we have here, and this is quite interesting that um, in verse 12, where it talks about there were a few people that, and they've probably been children, but they had a memory. They'd been there before. And and this is, to me, this, these verses are bittersweet because mm -hmm. you have the overwhelming, just like their hearts are exploding with joy that this is, they've waited their entire lives to worship the Lord Jehovah at the temple site and they're there and they've now built the foundation, which has got to have taken some time. I mean, the verses just jump along, but this has got to have taken some time and effort, yeah. but, but yet when those who have these memories, these ancient men, so many of the priests and, and Levites in verse 12, chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house. So the first temple, this is the temple of Zerubbabel, the second temple period. Those that had seen the first house, when the temple, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy, but Many people understand this. I mean, there's a weeping for joy, but part of this is also understood as weeping because this, is, like you say, like didn't really hold a candle <laughs> to the, the yeah. Temple of Solomon. Yeah. That they have a memory of this enormous, glorious, beautiful, precious materials from all over the ancient Near East, just an extraordinary building. And they're, they're probably seeing a little, very yeah. modest. Yeah you know, kind of almost just barely rising out of the rubble and thinking, yeah, oh, this it's, is, it, yeah. Yeah, it seems like it's going to be stone and nothing else, most likely, yeah. rather than the gold and the precious yeah. wood and everything yeah. that it was before. So it, it's just, it, it's happy, but for them, there's a feeling of this isn't the way it's supposed to be. Like they, they, yeah. you know, they know you know, from experience, even though it's probably the memory of a child, but the glory, because that, that's part of what temple is. It's a place where the, 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 chavod, the, the glory of God, the presence of God is manifest. And part of the way it's communicated is with the beauty of the building. And yeah. so they're like, oh, no, <laughs> this isn't, you know, and they, it's absolutely, and I think this kind of speaks to this whole era. They're doing the best they can. Is it everything you wish for? No, but they're, they're trying to do what they can given the circumstances they're in. And, and um, so, so it's not to take away from the joy, but I think it just, it complicates it. Again, it's just this really complex human experience of yep. grateful for what we have, but then when we realize what we don't have, sometimes it gets tinged with a little, a little bit of that bittersweet. Yeah. Um, and and so that I think this is how they're experiencing the joy. A um, little bit of, you know, kind of ambiguity of it's not just one thing or the other, the, the both of these feelings. Emotions are, there. are complex that way. Yeah. 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 And, and maybe for just a second, you, you used a phrase that I think is worth um, 
just uh, dwelling on for a second. This we, we have the first temple, which is usually referred to as Solomon's temple, which makes sense. He's the one that built it. And then we use the phrase second temple. Yeah. Um, and that's because the first temple's gone. And under here under Zerubbabel, they rebuild this temple. Yeah. Um, uh, and then Herod takes yeah. that same temple and refurbishes it. Yeah. Now, interestingly, most of the time when some people say second temple period, they mean Herod's temple. But that only lasts for like 70 years. Yeah. And, and uh, Solomon's temple lasts for several hundred years, but it's actually Zerubbabel's temple that stands the longest. It gets the least attention. Yeah. We, we know the least about it. We have the right. least historical details about it. And it's probably the, the least grand of the, those three uh, yeah. iterations of the temple. But uh, this, the second temple, m- the, almost all of the existence of the simple terri- second temple period is yeah. pre-Solomon or pre-Herod. Right. That's not what people usually mean when they say second exactly, temple. Exactly, because we have the New Testament and all of those descriptions of Christ in the temple as a child and then coming yeah. to teach in the temple. And so our focus is on the temple of Herod, which was apparently another extraordinary building in, in, in Roman time where there were extraordinary buildings all throughout the Mediterranean. It was still a, one of the wonders of yeah. the world in that time period, much yeah, as the, Solomon's temple was. And so, so I think, yeah, the Zerubbabel temple, so sort of that first part of the second temple period, even though it did last for a long time, it didn't necessarily inspire people to yeah. write about, right? Yeah. No one was yeah, writing yeah. home about the temple of Zerubbabel. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. You get these descriptions from Herod's temple where, uh, one one writer says, if you haven't seen uh, that temple, you haven't seen a beautiful building. Uh, yeah. But you don't have anyone saying that about Zerubbabel's temple. I'm sure no. it was a wonderful house of the Lord, but and, it's just not the same. Yeah, and, and it was it was what they could do at yep. this time. And I think that I get it probably helps us, you know, put things in perspective when either efforts we make or people around us make aren't necessarily living up to our expectations of the ideal way of things are done and realizing that's the Lord doesn't necessarily expect us. Our ideals are, are not the judge. Mm. I love you know, where, where Paul says, who art thou to judge another man's servant? Like yep. we're accountable to him and not to yep. our or other people's expectations. And so I think he was probably pleased and grateful that they were doing what they could with the resources they had available to yep. them. I, I, I cannot agree more and or, or, nor emphasize more that the Lord takes what you have to give. Yeah. And uh, I mean, if we're going to start the comparison game, we're going to lose. Yeah. We, we could all start to compare ourselves with President Nelson and not do well. Uh, but it doesn't really matter. The Lord isn't comparing like us, us in that way. He's right. asking us, what do we have? And then he'll accept yeah. what we have. And that that's giving what we have to give and doing the best that we can is, is the standard. I think that he's looking at us and he knows us and yep. And he knew them and and what they were doing. So and so this seems, modest temple yeah. served more people than any other temple. And I expect that the Lord is really happy about that. Yeah. That it was there for, and as you mentioned, for quite a long time until Herod yeah. came along and wanted a showpiece and wanted to, you know, get in good with the yeah. the Jews. And you know, he had his own agenda yep. for, for doing what he did. Yeah. Um, so it is, it's it's a it's a fascinating time to see this, um, this change. Now, if we turn maybe to the beginning of chapter four, uh, this is another point of ambiguity, I think, in my mind, and, mm-hmm. and there may be, there may be clearer, but it's, it's, it's so complicated that you have these people who, who love the Lord, but are coming from very different backgrounds and different experiences. And, and again, the, the term Samaritan here may not exactly line up with the group or the people in New Testament era, but it, it it's likely people who at least had a sense of identity of themselves as being part of the children of Israel. But the Jews who are coming back are looking at them and saying, um, no. Yeah. <laughs> and so the, the, you have that the tension that starts to build. And um, to me, I think it's, it, it goes back to this, that I think the, the leaders, of the Jews who are coming back and, and trying so hard to do their best to to make things right. Sometimes we get, I don't know, in in, in our effort to do that, we look back at maybe in mature mature eyes and say, you know, I could have done things differently. I could have 
and, and maybe if they were to look back at this this particular episode, they'd say, you know, maybe we could have handled it differently. Yeah. Yep. Um, where you see in in chapter four, um, verse maybe verse two. So yeah. you have these these people who are there in the land. And are they, are they Samaritans or are they part of the Jews that didn't go? It's hard to, to know exactly, but they come to Zerubbabel and they offer to help. Um, so they say unto him, let us build with you for we seek your God as ye do. And we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esarhaddon, the king of Assur, which has brought us up hither. So they might be going back to this time where you have the Assyrians who mixed in other peoples yeah. with um, the Northern kingdom that kind of developed their own identity. We know probably leading to the Samaritans, but they think of themselves as part of the house of Israel. They want to worship. And, but Zerubbabel, again, I, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. I think he was thinking, no, we've got to do it the right way. We don't want it to be corrupted. We don't want you to mess things up or do it wrong. And and so he, he tells them, no, in yeah. verse three, you have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel as the King Cyrus, the King of Persia hath commanded us. So to me, they just look at, I think, oh, is this a lost opportunity? I don't yeah. know. It's, yeah. it's. I mean, you can understand uh, the backstory yeah. there that, uh, I mean, these do seem to, at least some of them to be descended from the northern tribes right. with mixed whatever mixed and and there was a long-standing disagreement because when jeroboam starts that kingdom he changes the ritual festival yeah. calendar he appoints priests that aren't of levi and so on so there's already a long-standing feeling yeah. that the the people in the north don't do don't, things the right um, way and they're they're, yeah. they're correct in that does yeah. that mean god will never accept of anyone's true devotion I, no i don't think yeah. that's that's the case, but that that's that's the background that they're right. bringing with them as exactly. this group comes. Yeah, and so they're they're just feeling like we need to separate ourselves and do things. You know, we are the people. This is our work, and yeah. um, and so it's not like it's a position to judge. But I just know enough times in my life when I've taken a, a particular approach, and I look back and think, I didn't think I handled that as well as yeah. I could have. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I, I feel the same way. I, I wish I, I, I'm not judging, but I wish it yeah. had gone differently. I think that, yeah. that it could have been much smoother and helped a lot more people, but yeah. I wasn't there. So. Right. And yeah. And so that's, that's where they're, I think they're, they're doing their best. And, and I think that's one of the full, wonderful messages of, of the gospel is that the, because the Lord is working with us as human beings that I love the principle, um, that Elder Hafen taught in the broken heart. He put it so succinctly. He said, because of the atonement, we can learn from our mistakes rather than being condemned by them. And, mm. and I believe that that's going to be true even in the spirit world. Yeah. That we're, people are going to be able to look back and learn from things rather than being eternally condemned because of choices they made. And, and um, I, I just think it's wonderful. That is really is the good news of the reconciliation, um, both between us and our heavenly father that christ makes possible but also reconciliation with our brothers and sisters um, that yeah. christ came to give us a chance to learn and change and for some people be immortality others will be after and probably all be working on it for a while yeah i i agree <laughs> and, and there really is something to that uh, I'm, I'm just i mean to, to again make this real and personal i'm just thinking of a, an experience i had uh, over the weekend with uh, one of my children and uh, uh, wanting to do this. And it's something I initially didn't think was a good idea. And then I thought, you know what, right now, I think this is what we need to do. And afterwards reporting to my wife and she's like, you, you did what? And, and you just kind of have to say, well, you, you weren't there. I, I mean, at the time in that situation, this really did seem like the best thing. Maybe it wasn't, maybe if I'd had a long time to look back on it, it wasn't, yeah. but I, you weren't there. And it, it, when I was there, this is what seemed like we should do. Yeah. Um, and, and we need to remember that it's easy for us again, to look back to, so I, I, again, we're I'm just, not saying, I think this is a wonderful right, decision. I wish it had been different, but I'm looking 2000, 2,500 years later and yeah. saying, ah, yeah, here's, here's my armchair yeah. decision that exactly. this wasn't good. So anyway, yeah, no. And I do think that that I think is, is giving people the benefit of doubt as well, that given 
and I think that's a compassionate way of, of reading a text. One is looking for, you know, yeah. possible other options, but the other is saying, you know, assume that it, this will want people to be compassionate to us, that they are doing their best given, yeah. you know, the feelings and the, the, that they're coming from the, the world that they're living in. And the dangers they see that we exactly. may not and so that on. That they're trying to, yeah. um, to, to do, the, do what they can. Yeah. So, so just I'm, I'm not a big fan of some human. of, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not a big fan of some of Ezra's decisions either, but I just have to say that yeah. same thing. So, yeah. that they're, they're, and so it is. It's just it's an extraordinary and interesting thing. So we see this, this, you know, the next couple chapters is a little back and forth of, wait, yeah. are we really supposed to do this? Yes, we're supposed to do it. Look, here's our documentation. We've got proof, and um, so they get the the confirmation, and so. So finally, by, by Ezra 6.15, you get, um, after this sort of back and forth, the, the, the temple is finished. So the house was finished, and um, but it's finished, but it's like the work is not done. Yeah. <laughs> and so there's this ongoing, I think it's chapter seven, you see this, this ongoing process of rebuilding Jerusalem, reestablishing life lived by the law of Moses, and um, so there's reforms, that both to um, trying to, to, without going through sort of verse by verse, but try, again, trying to, and this is a, some of the challenge they have of like, let's covenant faithfulness has to do with marriage within the covenant, yeah. keeping the Sabbath, um, supporting the temple, all these, these commands of the law that are sort of get re, reiterated, this sense of they have to, uh, create a sense of identity as a people and that that's sort of what's pressing on them at this time yeah i i, I agree thank you so so that's um those are some thoughts on ezra i think you know with nehemiah um it's it's sort of like you you have a lot of the similar themes where he again just like you know Ezra was brought in from Babylon sort of like let's move things along and Nehemiah is being brought in from Shushan um, which is the, the Persians actually have three capitals it's really interesting yeah. so Shushan's one of their capitals and wants to contribute um, and I, I love this again it's the sense of he was in a position of power we we read um in verse 11, that he was the king's cupbearer. So he had a position of power, comfort, um, but but he wants, and I think this is something in verse three and four kind of speaks to me where um, he, he wants to contribute. And um, he has a sense that there's a need um, that, so it talks about great affliction, reproach, the wall of Jerusalem is broken down. The gates have been burned, and this this really moves him. And I and I think that there are going to be times in our lives where we have this this feeling of I need to be there. I need to do something that can sometimes move us from one place to another, or move us into a new chapter in our lives. When and I think we see this with Nehemiah, and so he's you know sort of this sort of coming from this desire of his heart to contribute and to build. And so. Um, in chapter two, you, you see his request where in verse four and five, the king said unto me, um, what does, for what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the, to the God of heaven and I said to the king, if it please the king. So he's still, he's part of the Persian empire. He's got to work with the, the, the political realities of his time. If it please the king and thy servant have found favor in thy sight that thou would send me unto Judah and to the city of my father's sepulchers that I may build it. So he's, he's asking for permission to go and to be a, a part of this new era. And um, it's an exciting time. It, you know, it's kind of calling forth people who are, have a, just tremendous courage. I, I have to look at these, these people, whether to, to go and rebuild a country, hard, hard work. And then he gets there and, you know, you look at chapter four and um, 
sort of pattern uh, that we saw a little bit in Ezra where the, the local population that had been there before, not very supportive. And um, so that they, they, they're, they're in a building mode, but they're also kind of in a defensive mode at the same time. Yeah, this kind of bad blood that uh, existed yeah. a bit before and then was heightened during the time of Zerubbabel between the Samaritans and the Jews yeah. gets heightened even more here. And yeah. uh, it just is a bad cycle. Yeah, and and it is unfortunate, and it's again it's so human. To talk about real, yeah. like this is the way you know you look at history and you look at societies and neighbors, and it's so often, and and even just us as human beings that we kind of get locked into these these sort of negative feedback loops. Yeah, oh, we're people, certainly in them in our society today. Yeah, and people, you know, it's hard to break out of being treated and then not treating other people well, and just goes around and around and around and so they're they're definitely in this this season of defensiveness trying to do do this work but but not necessarily in an open and collaborative yeah. moment <laughs> yeah so so that's it's kind of a sobering thing you see the the language about them in verse 18 about having the builders having a sword girded by his side and so he builds and so they're they're just they're trying to make it work nehemiah kind of helps organize it a little bit and um sort of maybe dividing the labor a little between the defense and the building but just trying to keep moving the work along and um and chapter five is interesting as well because going way back to exodus there's this this sort of principle that um because slavery in the ancient Near East was actually very widespread. And as, as you mentioned, slavery, redemption, something I've worked on and where people buy people out of bondage that have gotten either had were captives because they're prisoners of war, they'd sold themselves. But, but one of the principles was the Jews weren't supposed to, the children of Israel, because this goes back to Exodus, weren't, weren't supposed to have um, other Israelites as their slaves, you know, they, they could, work for them for a short period of time, but then they had to be released yeah. with the, the sabbatical, the, the seventh year. And the most common reason that people became slaves, I mean, there's war where you go and take war of splendor, yeah. but with, within a society, it's typically because someone can't Probably. pay their debt. Yeah, debt slavery. People would sell themselves or family members in order to meet their obligations. And so, yeah. so what seems to be happening in Nehemiah 5 is he's calling them on this, you know, I love this in verse eight, where he says, um, I said unto them, we, after our ability, have redeemed our brethren, the Jews, which were sold unto the heathen. So that he's bought them out of bondage, which is what yeah. redeem means is to buy out of bondage. And, but then he says, well, we've, we've, we've gone and rescued and redeemed, right? We've ransomed these other people now from the outsiders. Now, why are you doing this to other children of Israel. <laughs> it's like, oh. like what? So um, this is part of the law of Moses, actually, that they're not supposed to charge usury is the King James yeah. word, but interest, right? Yeah. You're supposed to lend to people, but other covenant people you lend free of charge. Yeah. You just do it to help them. Right. And in which case, then uh, most of this slavery is not going to happen. Uh, but because people can actually pay it off, but when the, the interest accrues, they'll never be able to pay it off. And so yeah. you, you trap them by having them pay the interest. And that so they're, they're breaking the law happens. of Moses in two ways here, yeah. because they're charging the interest and they're making slaves of their brethren. And, yeah. and Nehemiah is calling them on it, like yeah. you said. Exactly. And so he's, he's trying to make things right. So, so I think it, it goes to this, this, you know, this theme again of here are people who it's a long process. We're, we're working with other human beings, but trying to use the, the Lord's laws as a way to establish a just and a livable society where people can, can prosper rather than be trapped. And um, so I, I really admire Nehemiah for this. Um, yeah. And I think, that, and, 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 it's, and to their credit, if you look where he says in verse 11, sort of pleading with them, restore, I pray you, to them, even to say their lands, their vineyards, their olive yards, their houses, and also the hundredth part of the money of the corn and the wine and the oil that you exacted. And so like, 
because of with the sort of a, a society that's built on having small landholders, if people lose their land, their family's future is, is lost. And yeah. so this idea of bringing people back to their land is giving them a future, is giving their children a future. And what to their credit, because it's very easy once you get that to not want to let it go. But in verse 12, then they said, we will restore them and will require nothing of them. So will, will we do as thou sayest? And that's, that yeah. takes a lot because yep. people who become wealthy at other people's expense are generally not inclined yeah. <laughs> to, to give up the, the wealth that they've gotten and the lifestyle that they have at other people, you know, yep. having impoverished other people. So no, it's so, impressive. There are a number of reforms, some of which, uh, all of which are hard and some of yeah. which I'm not sure how I feel about and some of which I feel great about, but yeah. there are a number of reforms that uh, these leaders, Ezra and Nehemiah, are able to enact that it's, it's impressive that the people followed them on yeah. because they asked difficult thing after difficult thing after difficult thing, whether that be sacrificing to build the temple or build the wall mm -hmm. or uh, to let go of these uh, slaves and, and give uh, land and goods back these are tough things and yet the, and other reforms and and they did them yeah it really does i think it speaks to again these are you know they're, they're humans but that they they're people who they they came there because they want to be god's people and they yeah. want to and and so i think it's because we're constantly being asked to change and to repent and that as long as we keep listening, we're always going to have a distance to go. But as long as we keep listening to that voice and that often will come through the prophets or through the Lord's servants, or sometimes just through the promptings that we get and keep making the changes. It's not that we've arrived, but that we're on the right path. And that that's what the covenant's for is to help us keep, um, keep making adjustments to be more aligned with the Lord, more aligned with each other. And um, it's beautiful to see that happening, the people who are willing to make changes when asked by, um, by leaders. So it's, it's, yeah. a, it's an exciting time, as well as a really complicated time. Um, there's, these are what maybe one last passage I, and you might right. have more to talk about with Nehemiah 8 and Ezra the priest, because it's such no, this fascinating is this but, is great stuff. Yeah. We, we can end on this passage yeah. you're, you're bringing up. But here with, this is Nehemiah 6. And, and I, did, I, I think it just speaks to uh, that the, the people who chose to come, who wanted to be the Lord's people, were willing to have the faith and the persistence and the focus to do the Lord's work. And so this is a very famous passage, but, um, but I, I think it speaks because we, these are choices we have to make every day um, of where they're working to build the wall. And so because cities in the ancient world have walls and that's part of what makes them cities because it keeps them safe and it allows the people within them to have some stability and security. Yeah. And so they have to build this wall and they're, he's, he's getting hassled by other people. And, um, and he can tell in verse, the, the end of verse two, that these people do not have his, his best interest in mind, where they say, come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of o Ono, but they thought to do me mischief. So part mm -hmm. of it is a discernment that um, Nehemiah has that this, these are not his real friends, like to, to recognize who am I going to spend time with? Are these people that I want to spend time with? Or and this is a distraction. And I think learning to recognize where distractions are maybe one of the most important lessons we have in modernity when we're it's not just like people asking you to go and hang out in a village it's yeah. like a non-stop bombardment of anything and everything that you could pay attention to yeah and and the fact you have this nehemiah's language here i think is something we could each take into our own hearts and, and minds i sent messages unto them saying I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? And it's not saying you don't matter and I don't want to spend time with you. It's just saying that sometimes we have, we have to choose and choosing the Lord. Um, you know, it was, it was, I, I'm grateful for the life experience I have as a college student 
hearing the, the words of President Benson, when you put the Lord first, everything will fall into place or fall out of your life. And I've seen that be true over and over and over again. And this to me is, is an example of that, that choosing to say, I, this is my work. This is what I need to be doing. And, and making that a priority um, is a way of showing the Lord that, that he comes first. And maybe some other things have to go. We can't do everything. And that's just mortality. We cannot do everything. We have yeah. to pick. And, um, and I think Nehemiah is showing us sometimes that, that choosing, you know, when we, when we feel like this is the work we're doing is what the Lord wants us to be doing. Then we just, we focus on that and um, trust that, that things will work out. What a great message. Can't, can't think of a better message oh. to end on. So, well, thank you. You've certainly helped uh, the, these stories become more real to me and uh, help us think through what the lives of those people were like. And that helps us uh, see how our lives are not so dissimilar. And then we can more easily learn those lessons from them. Thank you for that. My pleasure. Thank you. This is wonderful visiting with you and getting to talk about our faithful sort of people who've gone before showing us yeah. the path. So these are sort of like pioneer day um, they, they really are they, they were pioneers in yeah. trying to build build the, the lord's work and moving moving his work forward so yeah well and, and bless them for it and we are blessed for it Amen. so and blessed for hearing from you thank you jennifer thank you and we hope uh, that uh, our audience will think of uh, someone that maybe could be blessed by hearing this and and share this with them as well so thank you and have a great day Thanks so